Good evening, everyone. How wonderful to be here. So the topic of my talk this evening is the 100-year life, educating Generation C, or Gen C, as I'm going to call them. I have no idea if the collective wisdom of crowds that agrees what the gens are, Gen X, Gen everything else, Gen Z, would agree with me, but this is my working title for them. They are Generation Climate, and for me, most recently, they've become Generation COVID. I've given them a great deal of thought, and I hope for as long as I have the privilege of being a school leader and a school principal, that I will continue to do so with as much vigor and passion as I do now, inspired by the people I work with and inspired by the pupils in our schools. So when you apply to run a school and you perhaps sort of reach the interview stages, um, two things happen. Firstly, people check out your track record. And usually when they do that, you're not in the room. They talk to people who have encountered you, who've been working alongside you, and all sorts of mysterious sources of information to inform the decisions. The bit where you are in the room is the bit where they ask you to share your educational vision. Until your first opportunity to do that, you may never have thought about exactly what it is, because until that point in your life, you've probably been employed to help deliver somebody else's vision. I certainly had. So when, just over 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to apply to run Cheltenham Ladies College, it was the first time I'd ever really thought deeply about what I believed to be important about education. It was clarifying. It needed to be eventually simplifying but it was profoundly energizing. For me, in 2010, this vision became the guiding force that has shaped everything I've tried to do since. And as I enter my second decade of perhaps headship, I don't know whether I'll be there for that long, where perhaps I'll outlive my usefulness. But my challenge to myself is to reinvigorate my vision as we come out of, or we come through, one of the most profound experiences of our shared world, namely the pandemic. So I'm going to uh, try and remember that mantra, indeed I do try on a daily basis, often fail, to remember to get inside the head of a 12-year-old boy. That gets harder as I get older. I'm also a trained engineer by profession, so I went back to first principles. And I tried not to make too many assumptions. So, from the top, life expectancy is increasing at the rate of approximately half an hour a day. It's based on some assumptions already. It's based on some extrapolations. However, that helps me get my arms around something that I can understand. Life expectancy increasing at the rate of half an hour a day. If you're under the age of 20, you have a 90% chance minimum probably of reaching the age of 100, barring some apocalyptic event or personal mishap. Stanford very recently have started to publish some um, research and some reflections into the 100-year life, economically, biologically, emotionally, psychologically. I think we are entering into an interesting period of reflection. And if we're educating Gen Z now, we need to understand that perspective and not the rear view mirror of the education that we had. So when I test drove this idea of a, a hundred year lifespan on my pupils, boys and girls in my previous school, the under 12s broke out into cheering, excitement. Um, they were coming up with oh, what they were going to do, etc. The mid-teenage classes looked very bewildered, rather thoughtful, mixed response, I would say. The sixth form just sort of clutched their head in the hands and groaned. <laughs> and I thought, how fascinating, because there you have the journey of adolescence as our brains develop 
the faculties of able to cope with more and more complexity, we realise just how complex the world is. So where are they now? Those kids that I spoke to in 2010, well, the youngest are just leaving university already. The six formers who are holding their head in, heads in their hands are 30 nearly, already. So in our schools, we now have six formers who will be 75 in 2080. And they'll probably still be working because <laughs> 80 is the new 60, 100 is the new 80, and so we go on. I wonder when we'll stop getting telegrams at 100. So last week, I met some prospective applicants for our school for 2023. They will be the graduating class of 2030. We need to be thinking now about your labour force that will be arriving in industry for your consideration for employment in the 2030s. We need to be thinking about that now and looking to the far horizon. So, who are Generation C? They will shape the world in which we will all grow old. So their values, their ethics, their compassion and their kindness and what they understand community to mean may have a very personal impact on us in the years in which we are perhaps more vulnerable than we are now. Some food for thought. They are also the best informed generation that has ever lived. They are alive at a time when the relationship between human beings and the technology that we are developing and creating is a growing to be more complex at an accelerating rate. Some of us feel that there might be an interesting point in the current lifetimes of our young people where the singularity arises, where we think about AI. This, we believe this could happen in the living lifetimes now of our young people in schools. They are also alive at a time when the world population is sort of talking about numbers like 7 billion, 8 billion, 9 billion. And there are three aspects about world population that I think about very carefully. One is the difference in the world between the age of the population shape of different countries. Because we have countries where it's an ageing population and other countries where it's the complete opposite. You have significant proportions of those countries' population who are under 40 or under 30 or even under 20. That population of the world is not a homogenous pattern at all across our planet. Statisticians have advised me that there are potentially more people alive now and will be alive this century than the cumulative total of humans that have ever lived. And the third aspect of world population growth that our young children, generation, your children, our children in our schools will be facing into is that we are urbanising at the moment. The world population is urbanising, so planned and unplanned. So as we develop more and more concentrations of humanity into urban settings, there's an opportunity for real innovation, biophilic design and planning, urban farms, vertical gardening, vertical farming, taking a different approach. Because if we don't, we're building in massive existential risk when the lights go out, when the food security problems come in the decades ahead, estimates are that we'd be four days away from anarchy. I remember the very beginning of the lockdown, first hard COVID lockdown, where there, were, there was no toilet paper in the supermarkets. I mean, let's think about it. Maybe we had a tiny taste of what we collectively do when we're really facing fear and uncertainty. So what does Gen C really need? Clearly, this is my personal perspective. Mark Malik Brown said several years ago, he believed that the illiterate of the 21st century would not be those who couldn't read and write. They would be those who could not learn, unlearn, and relearn. I believe that the most successful and resilient people in the next 100 years will be those who can cope and can, can, can deal with systems thinking, who profoundly understand the interdependence of us with each other and us with the natural world. 
actually this is a generation in our schools who have felt experientially through the pandemic what that interdependence actually means. My behaviour affects your health. My actions or inactions affect the safety and security of your family. I believe actually we will never have had a generation better equipped potentially to lead us eventually in this next hundred years. So we need to believe in them. We need to love them, we need to have faith in them and we need to support them in being courageous, imaginative and confident. I believe we need to help them to develop discernment, skills of judgment and the ability to simplify because they are going to be overwhelmed with information if we are not already. I believe they need to understand how to be a change maker. Most of them already want to be. They want to work for values and purpose-driven organisations. There is a collective altruism and selflessness amongst many of them that I have never witnessed before. And it is very, very inspiring for us to work in schools. When we glimpse that, we feel that around us. It's a hopeful place. So, we look also to higher education, to life after secondary education. And I'm noticing that in the higher education space at the moment, there are two interesting trends. One, as we come out of COVID and the digital galvanization that has happened in all educational settings to deliver education in ways we've never had to before, is making us consider the difference between synchronous learning and asynchronous. By that I mean, you have to be physically there, whether it's a screen or not, but with people in real time to do the learning together and to receive that. Asynchronous, you're going to do it by tuning in, logging on, accessing that learning at a time to suit you. We've never had such learning power, we've never had such technical opportunity to access both. We need to decide on the optimum balance. Too much of one or the other is not optimal and there are some serious mental health consequences that we're experiencing when we don't know what to, how to get the balance right. Asynchronous learning, I think, will develop on information that can be codified, content and knowledge that actually you can learn and absorb when you are educated or you are communicated with by people who really put that across clearly. But synchronous learning is very, very powerful. And this is why schools were the first um, organisations to reopen when other industries were actually kept locked down. Because synchronous learning, you learn from each other, not only from the person who's talking to you or teaching you, enabling your learning. Therefore, I believe in the years to come, we will see more and more evolution along the following pathway. Content is becoming the new abundance and Learning communities, cohorts, if you like, are becoming the new scarcity. So where do schools fit on that spectrum? Will there even be schools such as we would recognise them to be now by 2050? I hope they will be there, but I hope we've been able to innovate appropriately along the way. So if cohorts are increasingly important to develop critical wisdom, to develop deep understanding, not the codifiable content that you can access when you're on your own, then I believe that the diversity of those cohorts has a higher and higher prize value. It's going to become more and more important and valuable. So we should be asking ourselves in our businesses, in our neighbourhoods, in our societies, in our organisations, in our governments, who is not there? Who is not there? Who is not there yet? Or even if we're really brave, who are we not even seeing to know whether they're there or not? And are we looking for them? Finally, one of the TEDx talks, TED, forgive me, TED talks that I enjoyed so much during my own periods of lockdown was from a very charismatic Japanese-American entrepreneur who took his team away for um, a sort of deregulated away day. And he challenged them to try to get 
to simplify mission statements and vision statements and try to get the essence of what the company was really providing in three words. He gave them an example of, I won't name it, but a very well-known courier company who is really selling peace of mind. That transcends all the logistics. Peace of mind is what you're really buying when you go to this company. So for any school or any educational undertaking that I'm involved with, what I'm going to commit myself to in the years to come, the three words, lives with purpose. Thank you for listening to me this evening. Thank you. Thank you.